Miss the Get Published Radio Show. And here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has the answers because, well, he's made all the mistakes himself. On today's show, our topic is First Amendment challenges. It's all about freedom of expression and as someone who has a story to tell, how far can you go? It may sound contradictory, but all freedoms have limits. That's just the way it is. I may not agree with you, but I will defend not quite to the death your right to say it, because a lot of it is, frankly, just entertainment. One of this show's mantras is that there are no gatekeepers these days, and there are no agents, there are no editors, no publishers telling you what you should write. But also, that can be the bad news, because there's no one to stop you from making a fool of yourself. Now, in advertising here, we want to make sure that you understand none of us is an attorney, okay? We expressly reserve the right to play one on TV, but we're going to have a free-ranging roundtable discussion here about some of these issues, and it may, in fact, actually, we will have succeeded if we create more questions in your mind than answers. So it's not like we're giving answers, but some of these things are really relevant to what's going on, and we feel getting more important, because self-publishing is one of the most important things that you can do to keep debate going in this country. First Amendment, freedom of speech, Cheyenne, independence of the free press. Now, what about the old rule that no one has the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. (laughs) Well, I've always been of the notion that your rights end where someone else's begins. So yes, you have freedom of speech, but as soon as that encroaches on someone else's ability to live a but nice that's free just life. because you're you a know. nice person. If you want to be a journalist, <laughs> haven't you been paying any attention? You've got to offend people. Oh yeah, no. The, the offense isn't, you know, something that you can say, oh, I'm offended, you can't say that. But you have to understand something like yelling fire in a crowded theater, like yeah. your example, is going to endanger other people people's freedom. That's how people get trampled, especially if there's no fire. (laughs) What's the point? I have a feeling that this rule divides into whether you are, first of all, about personal insults that you're attacking somebody. If this is a public figure, there's generally a little more leeway to attack somebody. If this is a private figure, somebody goes about Yes, that's a hard line between public figure and That is where uh, you're asking for trouble. Yeah, I definitely think it's true. If you're a you know, public figure, you have to have some sort of expectation of a diminished privacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just as entitled to privacy in their personal lives as anyone else, but they're not going to get it. (laughs) Well, your public persona is, and and I think this is pretty well founded in not only in the law, but in practice is, you know, satire, making fun of somebody, making cartoons of them, uh, ridiculing them uh, and on talk shows, all that is perfect fair game if you're a public figure, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you were to take your next door neighbor, who is not a public figure, and say, Gerald Jones, I saw him on the street the other day, and this what a clown this guy is. Okay, th- now you've really... Are you cr- reading my blog, Jerry? Now you've really <laughs> crossed a lot. Well, actually, uh, I just think of it as great. You know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So I'd say, go go ahead, please. But but then to further insult me by saying I'm not a public figure is also to downplay the show. So, <laughs> yeah. so that would be libel and slander. Repeat, I guess what we might say well, is repeating all- gossip would be a, a good loose definition of that. Yeah, I mean, okay, differentiate between slander and Libel what first. is the difference? Slander I don't know. is spoken, libel's written. Oh. Uh, and it's only slander or libel if it's untrue. Yes, that's the whole, the truth is the best defense. And it's like, okay, people think, an author may think, oh, well, it's true. But the problem is, at least in California, and I know it's probably true every other place, you know, anybody can sue you for anything. So you do not want to be in a situation where you have to pay money to defend yourself, even if you're 100% in the right. Does the concept of invasion of privacy come into effect between uh, gossip and slander or libel. Is that a legal uh, defense or a legal attack? Invasion of privacy is not quite the same as those, but I think you could have a case where there are multiple offenses. I hear it spoken often for private citizens who feel that they've been slandered or libel. One or more of the legal thinkers come in says there's an invasion of privacy issue here. Right, It right. could be, yeah, if they're, you know, look, looking through windows or pe- going through trash. Sure. Yeah. And as I understand it, the, the exception to this, and it's a big exception, and uh, Hollywood relies on this, is once a person is dead, they have no expectation of privacy. Well, that's not completely true. There's a lot of contradicting court verdicts on that, actually. Well, if you're a celebrity, I know your celebrity exploitation 
persist. Yeah, but there was there was one particular ruling I was reading about actually. Really? Uh, bowling versus the Supreme Court, and that verdict said that something like doctor patient privilege is maintained even after death. Oh. So there okay. are certain mm. areas that are still guarded. Wow, it would seem to me you could get into a whole area of oh my you know my mother's memory has been impugned you know well, her reputation. People do get as, into that. Her reputation as a well certainly if she was Queen of England that would, would be public figure and we wouldn't really be able to defend that but if her say if she had founded a bank and that bank was still doing business then maybe somehow I've I'm going to deprive that bank of business if I say well you know the bank of Kathleen Jones is you know uh, not trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, that's a very complicated issue, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot of different decisions about well, it. Well, that's yeah. the thing is, you know, again, like we said, we're not lawyers, we can't give you advice. <laughs> yeah. But I think one piece of advice we can give you is there's a gray area in everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Presumably, God invented courts. It's, yeah, it's going to be up for debate regardless of, you know, whether the person's a public figure or not. I think it's something that you can kind of look at both sides and have some truth in both, depending on what it's relating to. One of the cases that keeps cropping up on a public celebrity who is dead is Marilyn Monroe. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are tons of lawsuits she and Elvis. centering around people who believe they have copyrighted certain images or copyright certain facets of their life. I believe one of them was We're going to go to the break, a break, Tom, and when we come back, I want to hear about your new novel about Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, Get Published is all about helping you. Yeah, I mean you get published. And these days, the way to go is self-publishing, where there are no agents or editors or big publishing houses telling you you can't or making you feel like you're not good enough. You know, going back in history, many famous authors were self-publishers. With his own printing press, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, long before he was a famous statesman. That's how we know Ben's saying, such as, Fish and visitors smell in three days. Seriously, if you want to change your life or change the world or both, it's a great time to get in the game. Ebooks are particularly easy. With a click, you can reach a worldwide audience. Did you know that there are more people in China who read English than those of us who use the language in all the rest of the world? So if you've got a story to tell, write that memoir or that novel that's been percolating in your head. And if you're an established professional, Or if you have a job you dislike or no job at all, give us that business or technical or even political book that establishes you as an expert who deserves serious attention. Yes, it's easy to get published, but understand you'll need help if you want professional results. Editors and copy editors help you clean up your prose. Book designers make the product eye-catching. And publicists help you be heard above all that social media noise. We have those support resources on our website, getpublishedradio.com. And there we've also got a request for services form where you can get personal attention for whatever might be keeping you from getting it done. That's why we say getpublishedradio.com is your doorway to unlimited self-expression. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. Use it or lose it. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. So, Tom, as a science fiction writer, uh, how about an idea of of a plot involving Marilyn Monroe? Actually, that's already been done. They're called inflatable dolls, (laughs) and you can get them in the mail. (laughs) My Inflatable Friend by Gerald Everett Jones. First book in the Rowley Hill series. Okay, I I got my plug in. But I think that's a great idea for artificial intelligence. Put in an intelligence of how you perceive this famous late dead person like George Washington or Marilyn Monroe or Al Capone would say in this thing and game it out. Well, we're, we're going to be able to clone, you know, if we have a piece of her fingernail, we'll we'll bring her back and then we got to figure out what to put in her head. And then, <laughs> oh, well, we can I, I want to get one too, you know, I put it over there and yeah. Well, My well Cheyenne, you know, coming back a bit more toward topic in terms of emulating or satirizing or if one might say ripping off 
uh, famous fiction. Uh, what about this notion of fan fiction? I, I really don't have much exposure to that. What is that? Um, I mean, I'm not someone that's really into that, but you do see a lot of it nowadays. It's extremely popular, you know, either riffing off of famous novels it's or like movies. like Jane Austen with zombies, right? Yeah, you know, you're taking an established concept and putting your own spin on it, maybe having it go somewhere else. I, I think that could be a really tricky area legally. Oh, incredibly. As uh, From what little I know about it, for example, you know, satire is one of the exceptions to, you know, permissions. Mm-hmm. Is If I blatantly satirize something, then that is considered to be fair game. And again, there's there's probably a gray area there and there's probably plenty of room for lawsuits. <laughs> but if I were to use the same characters and the same setting and the same premise and write the sequel, I've really crossed the line because that commercial property, you know, it has its copyright, it has its value, and it's perfectly within the scope of the rights holder. If they're not going to write the sequel, at least sell the rights to someone who's going to write the sequel. Yes. And we've seen this over and over over again with famous writers who've passed away where there's now somebody who is authorized to write the James Bond book. Oh, yeah. yeah. Raymond Chandler died. A guy wrote an unfinished Chandler book. Oh, that wonderful writer. Oh, he finished it, right, yeah. Yeah, Poodle Springs it was called. Yes. And my gosh, my mind is going. He was the guy who wrote the detective story Robert. set in Boston. Robert. Robert somebody. Yeah, yeah. okay. We're, both of our minds are going. <laughs> uh, Cheyenne's going to have to pull up the slack on that. Yeah, uh, I can try. But I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's a certain amount of admiration expressed and, and maybe the difference between admiration and satire may be a, a, a fine line. But this then I think comes back to a really basic question. And you hear people, uh, authors, beginning authors ask this all the time with the question of fair use. Yes. And uh, permission. And we have talked about it on a previous show pretty extensively. And if you go on Stanford's website, there is a very simple guide to fair use. They have a five step mm. system. Oh. Oh, that's good. And I know I talked about this before, but just to run through the steps really quick, you first want to determine if permission is needed, then identify who the owner is, identify the type of rights that you need to use whatever it is, a piece of art, whether it's exclusive, non-exclusive, then contact the owner to negotiate payment, and finally get your permission agreement in writing. And of course, the tricky question is that first one, is permission needed if we're talking about fair use? And uh, you know, there used to be, I have worked for book editors who are talking about book length, uh, lifts from book length stuff, and they go, oh, a thousand words. Well, that's an awful lot. The best guidance that I've heard, and again, it's not a legal thing because actually every copyright suit is is a separate thing. It's going to be in either a judge or a jury is going to decide, and it's a matter of interpretation. It's like what is pornography, okay? It, right. It, well, it, it may be a shifting thing. How you're using it. Right. Yeah. A good measure would be if you want to ask yourself as a test just to start is is what I'm borrowing significant enough in terms of percentage of the piece, whether it's a magazine article or a piece of you know, if it's one line of a poem, that's a big chunk of a poem. Yeah. Okay. If it's a paragraph in a short story, that's a big chunk of the short story. So if I'm going to quote the thesis of the short story, then the question is, is this going to deprive the copyright holder of potential income? In other mm-hmm. are, are people going to skip reading the article because I already gave them the spoiler? Yeah, and you're okay. seeing a lot, a lot of cases, especially recently in fashion, of all things. Big, huge stores like Zara and H&M and Forever 21 have these lawsuits against them because they're taking illustrations or phrases from very small local artists and mass producing it because they think, oh, you know, they have 2,000 Instagram followers. No one's going to notice. No one's going to take up a lawsuit. But they're these small artists are coming together and suing these huge companies for stealing their intellectual property. Well, you know, we've seen this yeah. with music, with, had- with, with like gr- garage bands uh, where the, the so-called mashup. Okay, so if I take a lot of different elements from a lot of different people... And so that is kind of like a collage, okay? That's a work. That's a unique work. But then again, there have been suits in in the music business of, you know, you stole four measures of beats Mm -hmm. from me. (laughs) And the same might be true of, like I said, of a paragraph or an illustration. What do you think, Tom? Oh, oh gosh, I think it depends on how public it is, doesn't it? How long it's been in... Well, 
it, if it's outside the term of copyright, but see that the term of copyright has changed. You know, now it's thanks uh, to in the, the Disney States, Company. Yeah, Mickey <laughs> yeah. Mouse would have disappeared from the commercial been carved world. up into thousands right, of pieces. Right, right, if not for the Sonny Bono Copyright Act. Uh, yeah. So as a result of that act, I believe the term of copyright is author's life plus seventy years. Wow. And then if it's a corporate, which is more in line with certain. I think it's the Geneva Copyright Convention. The other, the United States was different from uh, Europe and and a lot of the rest of the world for a long time. I don't know whether we're closer to it or not. They call it the Bern Convention. B E R N E is the World Copyright Agreement, whatever. Yeah. But as a rule of thumb, I mean, if something was published 200 years ago, you probably know that it's it's been in the public. But, yeah, the thing had, is, uh, but the thing is, if it was in a foreign language originally, and somebody translated it into English, and then you lift the English, well, that <laughs> translation, new, yeah. that translation is a new copyright the day that it was made. And depending on what you're using, too, you have to keep in mind that there may be, you know, surviving family members, like if it's a particular person, kind of answering to their estate, essentially. And you've seen that with a lot of celebrities. Well, yeah, and celebrity rights, that's been a big deal. And there have been deep pockets behind you know, defending those suits, you know, the whole, you know, Michael Jackson kind of legacy. Right. And now Prince and, you know, all, all that. And so, yes, you can look for analogies in other arts because to some extent music seems to be more on the cutting edge of a lot of these things you know music went digital first Mm -hmm. one of the interesting ones is copyrights of comedy routines which is hard and which is very clearly guys who've been ripped off oh and those people steal each other's jokes all the time they steal their jokes they steal their behavior Mm -hmm. Mort Saul has had run into this kind of thing how do you document that I don't know. The b- b- most famous case I remember was about a sock puppet that cropped up in a commercial as a character in a series of commercials back in the 80s. And it cannot be disclosed that Tom Page is not a sock puppet. That's so, right. Now you gave it away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> You're going to have to wrap it up, guys. Got to spin on the other yarn. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, in all the history of the world, with today's technology, it's never been easier to get published, to self-publish your printed book, e-book, audio book, even multimedia e-book. And not just novels and memoirs or how-to books and histories, although if that's what you've got, let's have it, but also poetry, spoken word, graphic novel, cartoons, children's picture book, interactive video, games, virtual reality, and imaginative mashups of all this stuff. Get into the game. Along the way, you'll no doubt need some professional help from an editor, a book designer, a publicist. But isn't the investment in yourself worth it? How about you take the money you'd spend on your next vacation and get famous instead? GetPublishedRadio.com. That's our support website where we've got links to all the resources you'll need. And don't forget that request for services form if you crave some personal attention. That's GetPublishedRadio.com. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. You can use it or lose it. You know, Runkey Productions, the audio magicians can take your radio shows, podcasts, audiobooks, and ads from the streets of New York to the outer reaches of the galaxy. I think we need more echo at the end of that. Now look, visit us at runkeeproductions.com. I still think we need more cowbell. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. We've been talking about the First Amendment and legal issues surrounding an author's ability to publish. And I wanted to just briefly uh, touch on, Cheyenne had done some research on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Yeah, so to, before we went to the break, we started to talk about, you know, kind of how music was really at the forefront, I think, of a lot of copyright issues. Things like, you know, the whole Napster scandal that happened years ago. And Digital Millennium Copyright Act essentially criminalized any sort of production or distribution of products that found a way around copyright protected implements, basically. So things like LimeWire and Napster were able to go around you having to 
to buy the CD or... But doesn't it them. also promote exchange in that if I post a picture on my blog and somebody, the copyright owner, contacts me, if I take it down, I mean, it, doesn't it put the permission cart before the horse kind of thing, or do you know? I don't know. I think that can be debated. I mean, Even putting it, it up without permission literally is a violation of copyright, yeah. but I think the Digital Millennium Copyright Act had put some procedure in place where you could cure a breach, and presumably you would have been doing your due diligence. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can always, well, I don't want to say always, but you can, I would say, most of the time come to an agreement with whoever the copyright owner is, even if you initially used it without permission. Well, the other thing about posts on the net is most of the things you're posting end up being promotional, have a promotional benefit for, you know, you're not trashing somebody. You're saying, look at this. No, but if you're profiting off it in any way, they need a cut. Well, isn't there a public discourse? course uh, item concerning all of this stuff, even if you are profiting off of something, isn't the internet doesn't mean it's in public. Maybe not email, but isn't it public? Is Facebook at all public or any of these other uh, things like that? I think it's definitely added to that gray area. It's like kind of what it goes back to. What do you need permission for? Really, even if it's someone's The point of the internet is to spread it around. The point of the internet is to... Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I definitely agree. The Internet was made so we could share information, but we still need to make sure that we're giving credit where credit is due. And we still own the content we create even after we post it. I mean, for example, unless the website we're posting to has got in its terms and conditions fine print that says if you post here, it becomes our property. There you You go. You do need to be careful about that. But, you know, for example, and I, I don't know that I would call it a book, but there are services that will, that will help you vacuum up all your posts and make a book out of it. I mean, which is really not book length, thoughtful debate in my mind. And I can't imagine who would want to read 300 successive blog posts of mm-hmm. of mine or anybody else's because it tends to be short attention span stuff. I mean, it was designed for short attention span, not for extended thought. Yeah, it's not the same format. You're not writing in the same way that you would for, you know, full length. Book. Well, even it's not a collection of short stories, even even oh, though, it could be. although there have been those authors. I just read uh, there was a there was some guy that he serialized his entire book on Twitter? Really? 140 characters at a time? Jeez. Oh. That's that's a really interesting concept. I actually like that. Getting a little piece of it every day. She would. She would. She's I, I so she's so millennial. <laughs> I wonder if there isn't a new possible narrative that's being presented to us. We had uh, the narrative of the novel mm-hmm. as a this is how you do a novel like out of the 19th century. And this well, is I do how think the cable series is the new program. novel. The internet is looking for this is the right thing to do well, on I the th- web. I think it's this at, is, yeah. I think it's at least least another option because we do we do have that quite a bit you'll see you know buzzfeed articles with people who kind of detail some weird experience they had out in the world in a series of tweets so i think yeah Mm -hmm. that's true tom it could be kind of our new way to tell a story because the audience is there people stick to the inner they glue themselves to it hours on end like you're reading a book if you put out a few interesting tweets yeah you're going to get followers of but get it arranged in such a special kind of way not necessarily chapters, but like a serial or something. Mm-hmm. Okay, listeners, there, there's your challenge. We're we're, that's what this show is about. We're, that's getting exactly published. right. We're going to have to invent some new absolutely. media, some new structures, some new forms, absolutely. and hopefully we will not be sticking necessarily to Aristotelian three-act structure. And, all and that the audience not, is not there that and they bad. will pay for it. Not that that's bad. So, yes, stay tuned. Well, we're going to have to dream up another episode on this because I think we've barely scratched the surface yeah. on this one as well. And that's our show. You know, Get Published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas. Even though we're deluged with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means, Please get published. 
The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Our producer is Lori Marple, and your announcer is Bill Navarro. Music by Jason Shaw. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com. And thanks for listening. <laughs>